From the Manhattan Project during World War II to the present, testing has been at the center of the DNA mission. Tests, whether conducted in the atmosphere, at sea, underground, or in the laboratory, are the most reliable means of ensuring that design relates to reality. Our knowledge of nuclear explosion phenomenology affecting equipment and personnel survivability must be proven. While this video has been designed primarily to assist new contract technical monitors, we hope to help all its viewers better understand how the Department of Defense and Energy test and evaluation programs and procedures have developed. United States nuclear testing goes back well over 40 years. During that period of time, DNA and its predecessors have conducted tests in every burst regime, from underground and underwater to surface and to space. International arms control agreements have dramatically altered testing methodology. Substitutes for atmospheric testing, nuclear devices or weapon systems have continued to add to our understanding of weapons and effects. Testing is used to examine effects phenomena such as air blast, thermal pulse, initial nuclear radiation, and electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. We look at their impact on military systems within various environments. We study how nuclear blasts disturb those layers of the atmosphere critical to the transmission and reception of radar and communications. The pre-dawn silence was broken on a July day in 1945 with the first nuclear weapon test, Trinity, near Alamogordo, New Mexico. As part of the Manhattan Project, begun in 1942, it was a test of the weapon design subsequently used in the attack on Nagasaki. Trinity was the first of over 200 tests the U.S. would conduct in the atmosphere. Although less than one-fourth of U.S. tests have been to study weapon effects, it is on this category that this video will be focusing. The first such tests were Operation Crossroads in 1946 at Bikini Atoll. At Bikini, older U.S. and Axis ships were exposed to an air and underwater nuclear burst. In 1947, the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project was established, responsible for all Armed Forces participation in developing military uses of atomic energy. The Manhattan Project facilities were transferred to the newly established Atomic Energy Commission. In 1948, the AEC conducted the first series to test more efficient designs to replace the tailor-made models employed in World War II. The tests were conducted on Enoe Tak Atoll in the South Pacific. This and Bikini Atoll would become the Pacific Proving Ground, the primary overseas site of U.S. nuclear testing. However, the South Pacific was too far away to meet military requirements to test smaller tactical weapons. So in 1951, Los Alamos National Laboratory and the Atomic Energy Commission selected the Nevada test site near Las Vegas for the first on-continent nuclear test since Trinity. Established primarily for military effects testing of fusion triggers and other peripheral equipment, NTS was also used for smaller tactical yield devices. Throughout the 1950s, testing alternated between the continental United States and the Pacific. Stimulated by Soviet detonation of its first nuclear device in 1949, the U.S. set out to develop a thermonuclear weapon. This was accomplished in November 1952 as part of the Operation Ivy series at Enoetok. By 1958, the number of tests grew from a few to a total of 55 announced detonations. During the early 1950s, nuclear scientists also used high explosive testing underwater and underground to study ground and water shock phenomena, cratering, soil influence, height of burst, depth of burst dependence, and scaling. The 1950s also ushered in a period of increased public concern about the dangers of atmospheric testing. Clearly, every effort needed to be made to reduce nuclear hazards. Three other sites were also used for testing in the 1950s. The open ocean about 500 miles west-southwest of San Diego for the Wigwam underwater test series in 1955 with submarine model targets. Johnston Island, 1,000 miles west of Hawaii, used in 1958 as a launch point for rocket-borne tests. 
and the remote South Atlantic Ocean, where warheads were rocketed from ships to high altitudes for nuclear weapons effects experiments in space. In 1956, a new kind of nuclear test began that later would be of great importance. A small device, Rainier, was detonated deep underground at NTS. All radioactive products were contained. This was to be the first step toward having all nuclear testing carried on below ground. From the fall of 1958 to late 1961, a voluntary moratorium on atmospheric testing went into effect between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. It was during this period in 1959 that the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project became the Defense Atomic Support Agency, or DASA. One of the first responsibilities of this new organization was the maintenance of atmospheric testing preparedness. Once testing resumed, the U.S. conducted an aggressive series of 89 announced tests in 1962. This included weapons development airdrops, a weapon delivery proof test off Christmas Island, high altitude and airdrop events near Johnston Island, an underwater test at the open ocean site off San Diego, and low yield surface and underground events at the Nevada test site. The limited test ban treaty of 1963 ended the opportunity to directly expose systems to full scale nuclear detonations. The three signatories were the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union. Testing from then on would be confined to underground tests that prevented radioactive debris from crossing international borders. After the treaty, the United States expanded its underground nuclear test program. The technical problems involved are severe, particularly for higher yield warheads. Still, scientists and technicians have been able to improve and update nuclear weapons effects data through underground testing and it remains our most reliable method for validating system hardness. Testing also began in the mid-1960s with high explosives and simulation devices to demonstrate systems effectiveness and survivability in a nuclear environment. DASA was renamed the Defense Nuclear Agency in 1971 with the transfer of research, development, test, and evaluation responsibilities to the services. Nuclear weapons effects and testing responsibilities remained with DNA, along with responsibility for Safeguard C readiness planning and coordination. A 150 kiloton underground test limitation was implemented in 1974, which imposed further restrictions. Today, DNA continues to operate the DOD underground nuclear weapons effects test program because only in an actual nuclear environment can some types of test objectives be achieved. However, wherever possible, use is made of less costly non-nuclear simulation techniques. One of these employs massive amounts of high explosives to simulate the impact of nuclear blast on components and systems. For these events, DNA provides test bed support to the services, other government agencies, and allied nations. High explosive charges and field tests have been used since 1945 to simulate nuclear weapon blast phenomena and effects. The need to simulate nuclear air blast with larger scale AT tests was spurred by the atmospheric testing halt in 1958. Since the limited nuclear test ban treaty in 1963, HE testing has become the primary method to assess blast hardness of large weapon systems. Developments led to the 500-ton snowball event in 1964, the first event to simulate blast and shock from a one kiloton nuclear surface burst. Both above ground and buried targets were exposed during snowball. Large-scale point charges simulating nuclear yields of a kiloton or greater can accommodate many kinds of experiments. Exposure of a variety of targets is possible, as well as the production of dust-filled air blast wave effects. HE has also been used for a wide range of special applications. The 1963 Distant Plane 4 event was used to examine the effects of tree blowdown on troop and vehicle movement. In 1965, naval ships and equipment were exposed to air blast and underwater shock during the Sailor Hat series. Later, the distant runner event was used to evaluate the vulnerabilities of hardened aircraft shelters. 
During the latter half of the 1960s, many large-scale HE tests were conducted in Canada using spherical charges. During this time, the U.S. shifted emphasis from ABM radar systems to missile silos for Minuteman and hard rock sites. Alternatives to TNT were explored, leading to the selection of ammonium nitrate and fuel oil, or ANFO, as an explosive source. ANFO is cheaper, safer, and generates a cleaner air blast. In the early 1970s, ANFO became the preferred explosive charge. Emphasis continued to be on testing to improve Minuteman silo hardness and less on MX basing schemes. Significant ground shock and cratering test results were achieved in events such as middle gust and mine throw. During the late 1970s, DNA established its permanent high explosive test site at White Sands Missile Range. The first large scale effects ANFO events emphasized the low altitude defense system. Later, ABM defense components were tested. The 1976 dice throw event was the first large event without a strong DNA theme. Rather, it was a community test bed for use by experimenters from many domestic and foreign agencies. Another large community test bed was the 1981 mill race event. This first field use of a thermal radiation source enabled the generation of blast and thermal effects. Since 1982, DNA has used containerized charges of anfoprils to match actual tactical nuclear yields. For the October 1983 direct course event, a sphere containing anfo mounted on a 166-foot tower was detonated to simulate for the first time a one kiloton airburst environment. It also included the first reusable thermal radiation source. Target systems tested with ANFO included the small ICBM, advanced hardened silos, and the hardened mobile launcher. One of the largest HE events to date was minor scale in June 1985. The detonation of nearly 5,000 tons of ANFO simulated an 8 kiloton nuclear surface burst. Again, air blast effects on the hardened mobile launcher were of great interest. More recently, Misty Picture and Miser's Goal in May 1987 and June 1989, respectively, simulated eight and four kiloton surface bursts. For Misty Picture, military equipment and facilities were subjected to air blast, ground motion, and other effects in over 150 experiments. Miser's Gold examined the response of tactical and strategic weapon systems, communications equipment, vehicles, and a variety of structures to a simulated nuclear environment. Several allied nations participated. In addition to large community test beds, DNA uses special configured explosive charges to test certain systems. These duplicate environments at a specified range to affect or determine geological properties, load-unload characteristics at a particular overpressure, and impulse loading for a range to affect and yield. As compared with general purpose events, special configurations require less explosive, cost less, and can produce higher yield phenomena to simulate nuclear situations. The first high explosive simulation technique, or HEST, tested local air blast effects on Miniman silos. Since HEST, DIHEST has been developed to simulate direct induced ground motions. A sophisticated variation is the Crater and Related Effects Simulation, or CARES program. An underwater HE tapered charge to test submarine shock is another specialized technique. Since the era of atmospheric testing, many new systems and targets such as silos and deep underground facilities have emerged. Others have become increasingly complex and hard, making the task of devising valid testing procedures even more of a challenge. In 1983, DOD established a requirement that systems performing critical missions in nuclear conflicts must be able to operate in that environment. This has led to increased emphasis on testing and validating nuclear weapons effect survivability for strategic and non-strategic forces. DNA test personnel and other research and development planners are addressing the needs of the services in these areas. 
a vigorous development program of simulation techniques continues to provide valuable targeting and survivability effects information. ensure the survivability and effectiveness of our nation's deterrent forces. Testing will remain critical to that mission. In the past, attention was focused on blast and thermal effects on military systems and structures. Current and planned testing also encompasses equipment hardness and protection from other no less serious effects such as EMP. The upper atmosphere and the impact of exoatmospheric burst radiation on military systems will also continue to be an important test environment. Essential to DNA's overall RDT&E effort is determining the response of new materials such as advanced composites to nuclear effects. Through testing, DNA will continue to seek essential data for identifying vulnerabilities and for establishing and validating design and performance criteria in support of DOD systems requirements. Within the restraints of national policy and arms control packs, DNA will continue to rely on underground nuclear events. Effect simulation facilities, however, will assume greater importance for survivability validation and performance evaluation. In the laboratory, such as at the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, DNA will sponsor research into the biological effects of nuclear radiation. Remaining data gaps will be filled through computer analysis and interpolation, validated when feasible with actual test data. The DNA recognizes that survivable and effective forces will continue to be the mainstay of national defense strategy. Accordingly, the DNA will continue to respond with imagination and vigor to satisfy the technology needs of the DOD agencies, the national laboratories, and the services. <laughs>